and we are now recording. Um, so thank you again for joining us for the basics, a jumpstart your job search for recent alumni. We, uh, today, mm -hmm, excuse me, uh, we will be going over resumes, job search, and Medicaid. Um, and so for our first section on resumes, I will be passing it off to our, uh, my colleague, Linda Lenore. Thank you very much. And let's see if I can't get this to move. Here we go. Okay, well, thank you and welcome everybody. It's so great to have so many of you sign up for this uh, because it is all about the basics. In the very short time that we have today, we are covering a lot of information. Uh, so we're gonna be going kind of quickly, but it's all pretty relevant and there's always a time for you to ask questions and to follow up later on with our resources that we'll be uh, presenting to you. So as Lauren said, I'm working with the basics on resumes. And I'm gonna be looking at giving you an overview of resumes, an anatomy of what a resume can consist of, as well as what a resume is in terms of having a master resume. So when you hear a resume, some of this may sound um, you know, pretty standard, like what is a resume? Well, a resume is indeed an attractive outline of relevant experience, skills, accomplishments, and academic uh, credentials. Key word is relevant. You are writing your resume with the reader or the employer in mind. You are going to be personalizing your resume to reflect your strengths, your interests, and the capabilities that you provide to an employer. Therefore, you are going to be tailoring or customizing it for each position that you apply to. We really promote this tailoring or customization as opposed to having a generic resume, one size fits all. Especially in this competitive uh, market, one size does not fit all. We want to talk um, briefly about using action verbs in a resume and making sure that you use bullets, not complete sentences, and no personal pronouns. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the why of that in a few minutes. References should be gathered but not put on a resume. So what are the key um, pieces of a resume? I'm going to just kind of bring each of these up. The contact information sounds so simple, but believe me, I've talked with many a person who has been so busy updating their resume that they look around and they've sent it to me to look at and their name has dropped off, literally. So always make sure that you have one of who you are, how you can be reached, and then when you get to the objective, what it is that you want to do. In the Career Center, we do promote an objective because it is used to help you to focus on what relevant information are you going to be promoting to the employer. Within that, you have your education, your experience, your extracurricular, and your skills. Among that information is going to be including paid, unpaid information, as well as rescinded job offers. Um, we understand that that has been more so this past semester, and so we do want to be sure to address that with you. We're looking at experiences both inside as well as outside of the classroom and the skills that you bring to a position. So when you look at a resume right away, here's Tommy Terrapin. Who, who is Tommy? How can you reach him? And he has on here all of his contact information. What he has missing, though, is his LinkedIn. And so that is something that you should be working on. If you don't have a LinkedIn profile, you should indeed develop one, and that link should be included on here too. I mentioned the objective. In this one, you can see Tommy's looking for an internship. He's looking for an internship in the field of communications, and he's also saying he wants to use some very specific skills. Based on that, with the objective, he's going to customize that. He's going to focus on either the title of the position, it could be communications associate. He's going to focus on the skills that he wants, as well as he's, he can talk about the um, particular employer or the environment that he wants to be in. An example, this was actually taken from Careers for Terps. There was an implementation consultant listed. Um, the skills that were needed were leadership, communication, and creative skills and someone who could work in a team environment. 
So you can take that and have by position, by skills, and where you can actually put in the specific employer. In this case, it was Fast, excuse me, Fast Enterprises LLC. So it could be by title, by skills, by employer or industry, or any combination of those. Below that, I think you can see a similar uh, writing for the public relations associate. And sometimes the industries that you see might be based on the fact that you are involved in that as an outside activity. How many of you, are, for instance, might be involved in uh, some form of, uh, um, say, sports? Well, you can actually look to the sports industry to see is there a public relations position. Once you have your, trying to move this forward. So here you have, the next thing you're gonna put in after your objective is your education. We like to promote that you are pushing first and foremost your degree, not the, not the university. So you're gonna have Bachelor of Arts spelled out and then the University of Maryland. Now I will say that there are some schools within the University of Maryland that really prefer for you to put them first. For instance, the A. James Clark School of Engineering, the Robert E. Smith, the Robert H. Smith Business School, um, and, and a couple of others where they really would like to have that first. It's your resume, it's up to you, okay? But we want to be sure that you do highlight the fact that you have received this bachelor's degree. Your experience is gonna be both relevant and work experience. Relevant, relevant to what? Relevant to that career objective that you've placed at the very top. So when you start talking about your experiences, those that really have something to do with that objective become the relevant experience. The other experience is still there, but it's second after relevant. It becomes work experience. Among the relevant experience, one of the biggest areas that uh, students especially tend to overlook has to do with your class projects. Um, somebody will say to me, well, I just don't have any experience, Ms. Lenore, what should I do? And I'm like, well, did you have a class last semester? Yeah. Did you have a project? Yes. What was that project? And you start thinking about it and it's like, oh, wow, I did have a class project. And well, this particular one, I was on a team or I did it independently. So when you reflect on your classes, that is what you're selling to the employer. But when you write it down, you don't put in the call number of Psych 148, you put in the name of the class. You put in the fact that you were a student and you were a member of a team and you move that forward. So that's how you want to be sure to describe that information. You want to have one there your papers, did you do a presentation? Was it a 10 page or a five page? Was it a PowerPoint? And the same thing goes for your internships, your volunteer experience. Sometimes you might've only volunteered one day to help out with a science fair at your own high school. Put that in there, okay? Put as much information as you can. And the canceled internships or those that were rescinded offers, Yes, you can put those in, and then I'll show you how that would be listed. You want to be sure to include keywords from your job description. A nice tool for you to write down is this one, tagcrowd.com. What you do is you take a job description, highlight the experience, and then copy and paste it into tagcrowd, hit the initialize or visualize button, and the top 50 words come out. What's great about that is that it helps you to speak the language of the position or the industry or the employer. So you might be putting a word in, but if you just change that word to their language, it makes, makes them see it as more relevant. So keywords become very, very important and you can get them from the job description. You want to make sure you're not vague, like help or assisted. How did you help? Well, I. I promoted the, um, the information through advertising. Use the word promoted instead of help. So think a little bit more creatively about how you can uh, really push forward those verbs. You're gonna group your experiences together. You're gonna to omit everything from high school after your sophomore years because you've all had these classes and you're gonna be able to keep this to one page. One way to go about describing 
your experiences is to think about the word ship. And I've highlighted what that means. Start with the verb, highlight the achievements, include the tailored uh, statements, and then provide quantitative data whenever possible. So how does that look? Which is more impressive, really? This is nice, but what about this? Where you actually write out the name of the position, although we might call you an RA, you were a resident assistant. And when you start talking about the, what you did, you're using numbers. If it's a single digit number, you spell it out. If it's two or more, you can write in the actual numbers. And you always put your dates to the far right. And those rescinded offers that we were just talking about, this is the way in which you can write that on there because it shows that somebody had a strong interest in you, they had an offer that you accepted and that it was canceled due to the COVID-19 budget cuts. But once you do accept an offer, remove that, that particular statement from your resume. Other sections that you might include are all kinds of skills. Once again, the relevancy uh, as to whether or not you include that. You're looking at how to format. You wanna make sure just like with the, the terap Tommy Terrapin, there's no excessive white space. You wanna make sure that you have good font and that people can see it. Use bolding and capitalization and avoid templates. Once you put something in a template, when you go back to try to enhance it, it's really difficult. So avoid the templates at all costs. This is what that particular resume might look like. Now, as you start putting all this information down, you're probably saying, well, well, Linda, how do I put it down? It's gonna be more than one page. It's okay. You're making a complete record of all of your in-class, out-of-class experiences, your volunteer, your internship, put in as much good stuff that you've done, as long as you have, want to make it. Make it two pages. You're gonna go back and pull from this master resume, depending on the position to which you are applying. I mentioned references. The best thing here is to make sure that you have talked with people ahead of time, you have their permission, you've told them what it is you want to do, you gather from them their contact information, you give your reference, the resume and the position description that you're applying to. And that way they know how to address any calls that might come in. You can bring this list to the interview or you could be prepared to provide it when you're asked. And if you get the position or you don't, be sure that you update your references at all times. Some pitfalls are listed here. You can read what they are. I've highlighted two of my pet peeves, the first one being typos, and the other is the use of personal pronouns, but all the others are just as important. On our website, we have a TERP guide that you can access, and in there, there is a resume checklist. What you're going to do is you're going to read, review, reread, and then you're gonna ask somebody else to look at it too because keep in mind, spell check does not know the difference, for instance, among these three ways of using the word there, but it can make a big difference in how it reads on your resume. You are out to put your best foot forward. You have to customize, target, focus your, your information, organize that information under relevant experiences, use those keywords, make sure that you address the qualifications, why you for this position. Show that you've done the research. Keep in mind that you are out to sell yourself to that employer based on your experiences. Next steps could include going to our website where we do have that TERP guide. Put the word TERP guide into the search bar and it'll come up. We also have a student tab. And in that tab, you're able to access quite a bit of information on resumes as well as other information. As you're starting to think about uh, positions that might be of interest, look at some of the postings that we have in the Careers for Terps, or you can look at the ones within Indeed.com. You'll see some of these listed. Go and use that Tag Crowd feature. Here's a good position. Let me throw it into Tag Crowd. Let me see what are some of the things that I need to highlight. And it helps you to get a better sense of what some of those positions are that you might want to target in your objective. Whenever you are sending your resume out, always follow up 
with both the employers and or the key contacts that you've been involved with. That is probably the fastest I've ever had to do a resume presentation, but hopefully you're able to glean some really good points from what I've already presented to you. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Lauren, and she's going to talk a little bit more about that job search. Lauren? Thanks so much, Linda. All right. I am not sure. Why? Aha. Okay. Um, so on um, talking about beginning of your job search, now that you have uh, formatted your resume and really uh, made it expertly tailored to the positions you're searching for, um, the first thing you're actually going to do is prepare for your search. Um, next, we'll look at identifying jobs um, and begin the application process, uh, making sure we talk about leveraging your networks, and then talking a little bit about what to do in the meantime. So we'll get started here. Oops. Okay, so in preparing for your search, the first thing to do is really clarify your interests, skills, and values. Um, and so, as you may have noticed by now, your major does not always translate directly into a career. Um, so really taking time to think about, um, in past experiences that you've had, what have you been most interested in? What are the things that you've enjoyed most about those positions? And pursuing opportunities like that in the future um, with this job search. Also thinking about your skills. So uh, you will have had to do that through making your resume, you know, really thinking about what skills you have and how to really market and communicate them for the positions you're looking for. But also thinking about your values. Um, so, you know, if you really value having time outside of work to spend with family or to devote to other hobbies, um, being, you know, a consultant in that work style where you're probably going to work, you know, definitely over 40 hours a week, maybe that's not where you're going to be happiest. So really trying to find positions that align with your values as well. Um, on the University Career Center website, we have a tool called the Focus 2 Assessment, which can help really give you a chance to see, um, you know, your interests, your skills, and your values, how all these align, and what types of careers um, these unique combinations uh, may represent for you. Next, you want to identify companies of interest. You may already have companies that you're interested in working for, um, but if not, a good place to start is with a simple Google search of the top companies to work for. Um, you can do a general search or you can look specifically in your field. So for example, um, this Glassdoor article on top healthcare companies to work for in 2020. Um, read through one of those lists, to check out a few of the companies and do some research, see what they're working on, see what um, open, uh, open positions they have um, and see what kind of projects they're working on. Next is knowing your salary needs. And this is not just kind of what you need, but also um, what you would like. Um, so in our, the University Career Center TERP guide, there are budgeting tools. Um, these are on pages 33 and 34 that can help you both figure out what a living uh, cost of living index is for the city you are living in or hoping to live in, and then also help you budget based on the expenses you currently have um, and goals that you have, um, either saving, maybe you're trying to pay off loans or put a down payment on a house. Um, so knowing your salary needs, but also doing some salary research. Um, so for the types of positions that you're looking for, um, Glassdoor is a great example of a way to find out what are comparable salaries for those types of positions um, at companies you might be looking into. So you can kind of know going in what you can expect. Um, and finally, perfecting your application documents. So Linda just went through um, how to perfect your resume, but also working on those cover letters and making sure that your Careers for Terps profile is updated with all of your most uh, current information. Next, you work on identifying jobs and beginning the application process. Now, by coming to this webinar today, this is a great first stop shop. Um, this, this is all great information for starting a general search, but to get personalized information for your specific interests and your specific search, I definitely recommend scheduling a job search appointment with a Career Center staff member. And you can do that through your Careers for Terps account. Also attending career fairs. The UMD virtual career fair will be next Tuesday, June 9th from 11 to 3 p.m. 
By going to the University Career Center events page, you can register an RSVP for that, uh, for that fair and also take a look at the employers who will be attending as well as the positions they're looking to hire for. Do a little bit of research and be prepared to talk with them the day of. Next is targeting job boards. Um, and Linda talked a little bit about this, but Careers for Terps is a great place to start. Um, making sure that all of your documents and that your um, profile is up to date there will make that search process a little bit smoother. But also looking on Indeed for a general search, Idealist, um, looking at nonprofit NGO type jobs, and USA jobs um, for those federal positions. Um, and do make sure the federal resume is different from a kind of more business oriented one. USA jobs does have a function to help you kind of format that, but again, scheduling um, an appointment with a career center staff member can help you really leverage um, all of your uh, skills and abilities. And finally, creating a schedule and tracking document. This can be uh, you know, as simple as an Excel document where you list all of the jobs you're applying for, the dates you applied to them, and the dates that you're looking to follow up when you've heard back from them. Um, but just really keeping a clear document of where you applied, when you applied, and what you're hearing back from them so far. Next is making sure to leverage your networks. So if you do not already have social media accounts, establishing them, um, and also making sure to clean up the ones you already have. Um, so making sure that they're private, making sure that you've removed any um, unprofessional photos or content, 90% um, of employers are now doing um, social media scans of potential uh, employees. So just making sure that you really have everything locked down um, and that you're also putting your best professional foot forward. So by creating a LinkedIn um, and really making sure that all of your skills, all of your experiences, all of your education is represented there. Um, and that's a part of building and maximizing the potential of your social network. So, you know, not just using LinkedIn um, to do a job search, but using it to connect with alumni uh, from the University of Maryland, connect with professors, connect with um, internship coordinators that you may have had in the past. Um, so really making sure that you're keeping those networks strong. Um, and a piece of that is leveraging your current network. Um, so making sure that you're not just creating new contacts, but that you're staying in contact with um, and keeping people you're already connected with up to date. And making sure that you follow up. Um, so you never know who maybe your friend's aunt might work in the same field or job that you're looking to work in. Um, you know, talking with her, making sure that you get that connection. And if you say that you're going to follow up with them, making sure that you do, right? Um, and then on the other side of that, once you've had the chance to reach out and talk to someone, making sure that you follow up with a thank you note or a thank you email, um, just to show that you really do appreciate their time. Finally, while you're doing all of those things, remember number one, that you are doing a good job, okay? Keep, uh, keep your tracking document um, going, keep your schedule going, um, and keep your spirits up, but also make sure that you're doing things outside of the job search to really make yourself a competitive applicant. Um, so for recent graduates, for the next 30-ish days, you will still have access to LinkedIn learning courses. Um, but outside of that, you can do other what are called MOOCs or massive open online courses through uh, sites such as Coursera and edX. Um, so you can learn, um, you can become an expert on topics, you can learn skills. Um, so there's a lot of different options and ways to keep learning and increase your knowledge and become more competitive. Also, opportunities to volunteer. Now, in these crazy times, um, volunteering in person may not always be available, um, but there are lots of great online volunteering sites. Um, the UN has online volunteering opportunities, as well as catchafireanddosomething.org are some great opportunities as well. Um, so they list volunteer or organizations who are looking for volunteers, um, and you can go on and apply through those websites. Also take the time to practice interviewing. Um, the University Career Center has a service called Interview Stream. Um, it's a virtual interviewing uh, video recording tool um, so that you can choose 
the questions you would like to answer, record yourself answering them, and then review your performance. Um, so practicing interviewing is a great thing to be doing right now while you're waiting to get those interviews. And finally, perfecting your virtual communication. And this leads right into my colleague, Pamela Allen, who will be talking about how to perfect that communication through the use of good netiquette. And so now I will be passing this on to Pam. Okay, Pam. Good. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes. Okay. Just testing this out. Pamela, are you doing okay? <laughs> okay. Hello. Yes. Okay. I apologize, everybody. I had unmuted myself and then somehow it got remuted. So I'm just going to start here at Netiquette. I was going prior to this, I was just saying all the things that you heard Miss Lauren talk about, the different things about the job networking, reaching out through LinkedIn, the important things that you heard from Ms. Lenore talking about in the resume. The resume serves as an important document and tool to help people learn about yourself in a short amount of time. What we're gonna talk about in Netiquette is the proper protocol, the proper way to be reaching out, interacting, communicating with people via email, a social media, or any other platforms. Okay, oops. Now, it's important, and you hear this a lot in job searching, that how you present yourself. Well, it's extremely important when you're looking to communicate with others. So, Netiquette has many rules and protocols to maintain a strong communication presence virtually. But today we're gonna to just talk about the short list. So we're gonna begin with know the reader and remember you're dealing with a human, be professional. Consider the type of technology or how others can use their technology. 
follow the instructions and check before you send. Now, netiquette, rules, first one, know the reader. I'm going to also just admit, number one, the person who's usually reading this is a human. I didn't say usual, because sometimes things when you submit, like such as a, a application, a resume, it could be looked at through an electronic device or through an algorithm. However, most of the time it ends up with somebody else looking at it. The other thing is, the most common way somebody may see you is through an email, or many of you will use a form of social media. But it's key to know who is reading this communication. Is it the frontline recruiter? Maybe somebody you have met at a job fair or even a virtual job fair? Or is it a potential supervisor? Also, it could be a different type situation when you're networking, even virtually. So your style and your tone may end up being different. You want to be professional. Because remember, you're not communicating with your mom or dad or friends or classmates. So you, your key thing is that you want to remember to remain professional. Know where it should be directed to. I'm going to say this one again. Know where it should be directed to. We have heard from recruiters that sometimes they will get emails that were directed maybe to be uh, directed to other people in the organization that should have come to them. Or worse, the email was supposed to go to another organization. How embarrassing. Most of the time, you may never know about it. And then you wonder, why am I not getting an interview? Or worse, why didn't I get the job? So make sure you know where it should be directed to. Is it to go to the recruiter? Or is it to go to the supervisor? Or who is it to go to? Know your contact or referral. Oftentimes, you will be told to go to LinkedIn. You may find out that there's somebody who's from communications that you've been directed to or somebody who is a computer science major. Before you reach out to them, learn about them. Who are they? And you can do that through LinkedIn. And many times too, even if you get a referral and for some crazy reason, they may not be listed in LinkedIn, still try Googling them. See what positive things come up about. Okay, we addressed this a little bit, but netiquette rules, the professional tone. And it's important, like how are you addressing people? A key thing here, some of people like to make sure their point's coming across. And what do they do? They put it in capitals. Well, somebody who's reading your correspondence may think, if you have everything in capitals that you are yelling at them. So be conscious of how you are writing and delivering the information. Stay away from putting everything in capitals. Yes, there are times you are supposed to use capitals. However, that's supposed to be used grammatically correct. But stay away from putting everything in capitals. When you are trying to make connections with others who may be in your desired industry that you are exploring or considering going into, use their language. I work with a lot of students on campus here. Some are in information sciences. 
And what's the favorite word or I think comes up a lot? Users, user X systems. Well, that's great. Use that language or type of language that's very common in the industry. Make sure that you're using that at that time when you're communicating with others in an email through social media. Then they'll feel like you, you're knowing what you're talking about or learning to achieve how to better communicate in that particular industry. Technology and social media netiquette rules. This is really important also. Not everybody is using the same technology. Not everybody uses the same social media. So consider the technology that is being used by an individual or even more important, consider the technology and social media that's being used by the organization you may be trying to reach out to or even excuse me, the organization where your possible contact network is working at. Not all organizations allow the people to use certain social medias or technologies. If any of you are aspiring to work with any of the security organizations in the government, many of them have to forego social medias like it's our CIA or the National Security a Agency called NSA. <clears throat> and so that's important to find out. Is the reader familiar with the technology you are using? Now, if they've indicated, yes, most likely they are familiar with it. They want you to use an email or a certain email. If they want you to use a social media or a certain type of social media, most likely 99% of the time that they should, will be familiar with it. But please, please, please be respectful if they are not. Be respectful if they are not at your level with the technology or social media. Because after all, remember, they have the job. They are at the organization that you may be desiring to enter into that you are desiring to get a position or an internship there. So again, be respectful of people, whatever level they are at, whatever familiarity they know about the technology or social media. Accuracy, another important etiquette rule. Check before you sin. I'm gonna say it again, check before you sin. And I think I'll say it one more time. Check before you sin. This is important, just as Ms. Lenore emphasized in the resume, and that's just one doc document that you're constantly working with. It's so important that you look at what you're going to send, whether you're going to text it, email it, or use social media. Is it properly constructed? Are there any errors? Are there any spelling errors that are taking place? Are the names and titles, positions and departments or other things correct? Is the address correct? So I want you always to remember when you're communicating, stop, review it, and look at it again. And the other thing, many of you do this, something comes to, to you over the phone and, and immediately you start to have your fingers go tap, 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 and you respond. I'm gonna tell you to institute a new practice. If you get a response from a connection, like a network connection, from a possible internship site or job organization and it's coming over your phone, put that phone down and walk away. 
take a moment to think about it. Take a moment to reread what they sent. Think about how you're going to respond. Type your response out, but as a draft. Review it. Is it correct? Are there any errors? Do you have to maybe make a copy of it and send it by email, text to someone else to review it, to proof it before you send it? And now I'm gonna say about, is the address correct? This is an important thing too, because a lot of times employers have told us they've gotten emails and texts, and I may mention this before, from people that were supposed to go to another organization. This can happen com commonly if you're about ready to send off, you got that phone in your hand and you ready to hit send and you go, oh no, it was the wrong address. It was the wrong phone number that you were supposed to send it to. So make sure you know who you're sending it to. Instructions, another important part about netiquette. Acknowledge information that you receive. A lot of you will get emails or texts or something or some form of a information from perhaps a prospective employer or even a network contact. Acknowledge, follow up with them, thanking them for the information and instructions. The other key thing is, is to send what is needed. Send what the organization is requesting. Read the instructions, reread the email, text, to see what is it that they're requesting and deliver that to them. Deliver them that to them in the format that they are asking. For example, a lot of organizations may want to see how you communicate in writing. So if they ask you to send two to three page writing sample in a PDF format, do that. Some organizations, for security reasons, they may be only able to use a certain system and it has to be set up a certain way. Make sure you would adhere to the instructions. Okay, now, let, now that we've gone over some of the, the, the rules, the short list, what's it like to put something in action? What's it like to respond to someone or to reach out to someone in LinkedIn? Well, here is an example of how possibly to connect with a possible alum or contact in LinkedIn. And you can see here, I have it written out and it's under 300 characters. Not words, characters. Why am I emphasizing this? I'm emphasizing this because this is the requirement of LinkedIn, that they say 300 characters or less, and they mean spaces and, and letters and other areas. So please heed that so you can reach someone. This is a sample of how you could reach out to someone who may be in LinkedIn. And you see, it's identifying yourself. And that's already gonna be electronically noted, but who you are, why you wanna reach out to them, and you're requesting to them if they would reply to you to have a conversation, to learn more about who they are, their career path, and industry trends. When they respond back, make sure you know more about them by researching what was in their profile. For some students who may want to get into more research or writing, there may be other things on this person out there in the internet or in their profile. Look it up and if they have writings, read them. The same, when you, same goes for when you need to get a reference, maybe from a professor, Look at what they have done. Look at their research. 
Now, again, I said this is a sample for social, a social media, but it could be different for an email. We have some information indicated about how to write an email. And I'll show you that. Okay, this is found in our TERP guide, which you can find on the web, our careers.umd.edu. And this is where our TERP guide is located at. And this is one of our pages that you can see has some great information. This one is about email correspondence and it gives you a sample of how to structure it, how to send it to, some of the key things can be the subject line, how you structure that, the content, and even your address. But what it says, even under that last chance area, proof, reread, make sure you're doing it correctly. Okay, well, thank you for staying and participating in our presentation today. And I'm sure you may have some questions and please again, start sending those questions to me and uh, we will begin getting a chance to start talking about that. But we also wanted to make you aware of other things coming up. We have our summer career series, which is a number of different events that are occurring here throughout the season. And we also have a virtual career fair that's coming up. And that's going to be on June 9th. And um, on June 5th and June 8th, we have a how to be prepared for a virtual career fair. And so that will also be another Zoom presentation where you can learn how to maneuver if you have not ever gone to a virtual fair before. Okay. Okay, so this is a time for more questions in the send in, and we will start, get, uh, I will take a look at your questions of what's coming up, but I also wanted to keep in mind of how you can contact us in case we don't answer all your questions, in case you wanna make an appointment, in case you wanna use our other social media to reach out to us and make sure you're still, even as an alum, still looking at Careers for Turks because we will be putting in more opportunities. We have employers who want to hire our students for internships. We have employers who want to hire our recent graduates. We have employers that want to hire even our seasoned or people who, students who've been out, alums who've been already out there and have graduated. So stay in touch with us. So I'm gonna to start to take a look to see what questions we have started to come in. And as a reminder, um, please send your questions in to Pamela, but also if you haven't already, please remember to send either your UID or your email address that is attached to your Careers for Trips account. Um, so that we can uh, keep track of how many people we were able to um, touch today with this information. Okay, I'm going to begin with this question that says, and this, uh, I'm just going to read it. This is from Christina. A lot of companies say that they cannot respond to all applicants. And what does this mean in terms of reaching out to those companies about the applicant application status? And I know some of you really get concerned about this as you're trying to actively do your job search strategy. And so 
I will take a shot at responding to this and Lauren, you may have something else to add to this. One of the things, adhere to what the company or organization is saying. This is also helpful if you have a network, a relationship with somebody at the organization, maybe you can inquire through them, is this normal position? Or if there's a way they can provide any input into helping your application or resume move along. Yeah, thanks, Pam. Um, I think also um, if the question is pertaining um, to, you know, you may have applied, you haven't heard back, but they have that kind of disclaimer, so you might not hear back anyway. It never hurts to try to follow up um, and just uh, send a simple, inf a simple email um, that may say something along the lines of, um, you know, I introduce yourself, your name, um, say when you applied, what position you applied for, the date you applied, um, that you are reaffirming your interest um, and, you know, hope to hear back soon. You could, re you could attach your resume um, for reference as well. Um, but I would say definitely follow up. Um, even if they say, you know, you might not hear back, just try to get a response um, by following up. Linda, Thank do you, you. add on that? No, I think that sounds great. Um, I'm trying to make time for some other questions, yeah. but I think mm -hmm. basically the follow up, follow through, follow up, follow through, because most people don't do that. Okay, I'm gonna put this out to, to my other colleagues here. How do we go about booking an appointment with the Career Center to discuss job opportunities? Perfect. Um, so I had mentioned that that is a perfect next step to take. Um, this by going uh, logging into your careers for Terps account on the home page along the right hand side in the short link section, um, there is a, a quick link to create or to make a career advising appointment. Um, you could sift through by your availability by the topic that you want um, or just search um, generally uh, by the day you're looking for. Um, and then from there, you would be able to select um, from the different available uh, career advisors to meet with. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. Linda, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. This, uh, I have a question from a person said so they had, were out of the States and they were wondering, should they put this experience, their international experience on their resume? They are currently out of state or they were? They're back. They're back They're in back. the United States. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Uh, what I look at there is it depends on what the experience is. So first and foremost, kind of get all the experience um, action verbs together to describe what you did. Put it on that master resume. And then depending on the position that you're uh, applying to, it becomes either relevant experience or other experience. But experience is experience. So find the right words that you need in order to describe it. And as I said, depending on the position, it'll either be in one area or the other. Okay. And I'm also gonna follow up too with that, Linda, because there's another person asking if employers take international experience seriously. And uh, yeah. Oh my gosh, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and I think any one of us could probably answer that, mm -hmm. but international experience really is very valuable because it's showing that you can work with various cultures and you bring a different insight to a person, um, or to a team um, where the employers are looking for a variety of, of individuals who can really relate to what it is they're about. And cultural diversity is still very much honored. Thank you. Lauren, did you want to add anything to that? Or you good? I think you all uh, touched on it okay. really well. I, the only thing I would add is that, you know, if it is like a study abroad type of experience, um, that also communicates a curiosity as well. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So definitely noting somewhere that you have that type of experience um, says something about the type of employee you will be because of the type of student that you were. Um, so I think that definitely including those international experiences are good. Great, thanks. I have another question. Other than virtual career fairs, how can we network 
in this virtual environment. Is social media the best way? No. I'll start off taking a stab at this question. I was gonna say virtual career fairs, yes, are one way. But remember, even before COVID, during COVID and after it, also look at the organizations and maybe there's other groups, professional groups, or where you're, you're, where you're planning to go to work at, what industry. They may have job opportunities posted with their members organizations that could be listed online. There's other social medias that are also very helpful. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues to see if they have anything to add to that. If there are other opportunities to find jobs or internships besides a virtual career fair. You know, the one thing I often think about is, first of all, don't let your looking for a job be the best kept secret. Let everybody you know know that you are looking for a job. So that becomes both the social media, possibly on your Facebook, but definitely with LinkedIn, updating your um, original uh, summary paragraph to say that you are, you've graduated and you've looked for a job. Uh, look at the employers that you're interested in and follow them because very often they will have the, uh, the heads up and will post that they're looking for a particular individual. So update your information, let other people know, let people in your inner circle know, people that you have volunteered and worked with. Those are all uh, great ways of looking for a job during this time. And the other, I think Lauren's um, talked a lot about those in her presentation. So uh, Lauren, do you want to kind of follow up a little bit with that? Some of the things that you were talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So LinkedIn is a great one. Um, Linda's absolutely right. Update your information. Um, you can have uh, your headline, you know, say that you are, you know, for example, my students might be a recent public health graduate looking um, for opportunities in epidemiology, for example, right? Um, so really targeted messaging about what it is that you're look that you are looking for. Um, but Linda also messaged, you know, or mentioned talking to to your friends, talking to your family, talking to you know, as a recent graduate, um, you get asked all the time, right? Like, what are you doing? Um, or even as a current student, um, you know, what are you doing? What are your plans? That's a great opportunity just to let everyone in your life know what you're looking for. So if they come across anything, they can say, oh, you know, my niece or my nephew or um, my granddaughter is really interested in that. Can I connect you? So those are other great things to do. Um, also, Pamela mentioned, you know, professional associations, getting involved there, um, staying up to date on what the current trends in the field are. Um, and, you know, going, um, being active in those, those chat groups, also using Twitter. Um, so following organizations that you're interested in on Twitter, um, you know, tweeting uh, about an, a project that they might be doing and tagging them in that. Um, same with LinkedIn, you know, not just connecting with people or job searching, but reading articles and posting your analysis of that article and maybe mentioning the organization. Um, those are all really good ways to mm -hmm virtually um, without even necessarily having to have a direct contact, um, but they often can lead to direct contacts. So being really creative about the ways that you engage online as well. I do want to add one last thing to that. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't work with the Alumni Association, and that is Terrapins Connect. Uh, there is a pool that they have where we have over 2,000 alumni who have said basically, hey, I'd love to talk with Alum, with the students and alumni in order to let you know about what I do for in my job, what it's like at a particular um, employer. But go to Terrapins Connect through the Alumni Association, sign up, it is free, and you can basically end up having a nice informal opportunity to talk with an alum who can describe what is it like working for this association or working in a, in a particular field. And once again, by getting somebody from the inside, should something open up, they are in the perfect position to say, hey, there's a University of Maryland uh, graduate that I spoke with who would really be good for this position. Linda, I got another question for you. Mm -hmm. Someone's saying they've been told to leave out the objective when submitting um, the resume to an employee. Is this correct or is it employer dependent? Well, as I said from the beginning, first of all, 
the resume is your resume. You do what you want and what you think works. What we are hearing from employers though is that it is best when it is targeted, when it is focused. If I'm an employer, even pre-COVID-19, if I have received 100 resumes and five of them have in there that they're looking specifically for a particular position and they're talking about what they bring to that position because they have an objective, I'm more inclined to say, wow, they really did their research. They really are interested in me. And gee, look at these skills that they bring. So the targeting can be, be made primarily in the resume, as well as it helps you then to define the experiences, the educational um, opportunities you've had, and how that relates to the position. So if you're dealing with one page to market yourself, the objective helps you to really focus not only your skills, but focus the reader's, the reader's eyes on what it is that you bring to the organization or to the position. So um, that's why you might have two or three or four different resumes. When you have the generic one without, it just is not as, um, it's like, well, here I am, what can you do for me? As opposed to, here I am, and this is what I can do for you. So I, I say do the objective. It's the hardest thing to do, but it's the most rewarding. Okay, I have two more questions I'm going to ask one. Uh, before we end our session. And so one of them, and Lauren, maybe you can help with this one. If a job posting is many months old, is it still worthwhile to apply to it? I'm going to make a response here first. If a job position that you see somewhere that's been up there looks like a long time, two things or a couple things you can approach it. First of all, is it an organization that you're interested in? Do they leave a contact? Maybe this is a good way to reach out to that organization to say I, uh, that I see you had a posting up here, that you were interested in the, this possible position or anything else that may be available at that industry. So I personally would say still apply, but maybe it's not on your hot list, but it's still a way to make a contact, to still explore that company, but only if you're interested in that industry or organization. Do you have anything to add to that, Lauren? Yeah, you know, I, I think where um, what you mentioned, you know, maybe still apply, but it's not on your hot list. I would not suggest prioritizing that one. So if there are other um, positions that you're seeing that have been posted within you know, the last week to two weeks, definitely prioritize ap applying to those um, before you, you know, really put all your effort into the um, maybe month to two month old position. Um, I would also suggest doing a little bit more research. So, you know, looking closely at the post, do they have a best consideration by date? Um, is it, you know, is the position open until filled? Um, is there a deadline for the application, but maybe the recruiters just forgot to pull it down? Um, so that's a really good way to assess kind of what is the status of that search. Um, you know, you can also go um, search for the organization and the position title name. You know, have they filled it? Is there someone um, in their staff who's currently holding that position? Um, but also, as Pam noted, you know, if they have a, uh, a contact uh, for the position, reaching out and just, you know, saying, hey, I'm really interested in this position, but also I'm really interested in working for this company. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to know if the position's still open, I'd love to be considered um, and submit my application. Um, if not, you know, I'd love to connect and, and learn a little bit more about the organization or, you know, just ask if there are current, other current availabilities. Um, so, like I said, maybe not the priority, but definitely potentially an opening. Thank you, Lauren. And Linda, I'm going to have you answer this question. Someone was really pleased to hear that you shared about Terrapins Connect. They said, is there a link or something that they can get in touch or get access to Terrapins Connect? Linda, if you're muted. Linda. You might be muted. Okay, I didn't 
check my phone. Well, I'm going to go ahead and take a, a chance to respond to that. Mm -hmm. We do, I don't have it memorized, but again, if you go to our website, careers.umd.edu, you'll be able to find out some more information. Like if you just put it in our search box, it will take you or a different site will come up about the Terrapins Connect. And so, yes, there is information out there and that we have it on our website and it's found on a couple different pages, both in our site. Also, check with your colleges. We have about five colleges that have a career website or office. They include one already that has a program director and that's in the School of Public Health, our own Lauren Myers. So they have their website, School of Behavioral and Social Sciences, Arts and Humanities, um, Agricultural Natural Resources, Computer Natural and Physical Sciences, and Computer Sciences. And I believe I covered all of them, but check out their web sites, their career areas, and they will have information that can directly help you, but also they usually have Terrapins Connect listed. Okay. Okay. And Linda, I think you're back. Do you have anything to add to that about the Terrapins Connect? Somebody was trying to uh, find out how they could access it. Okay. Unfortunately, she was having some trouble with her connection. But again, we can help you directly if you send that to either one of us or to the Career Center email and we'll put you in touch. Okay. I think, Linda, I unmuted you. You yeah. might speak now. Yeah. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. I, I was in and out, so I apologize to everybody. But my colleagues are well versed in all the resources that we have with the uh, Terrapins Connect. You can locate that both on our website as well as the Alumni Association website. And um, they are really pushing that. Just go to the alumni.umd.edu. The other would be to also think about your, as Pamela, I heard say, to, to uh, work with your colleges because very often they're working closely with their alumni. And the others within the association, there are over 20 different affinity groups. And to really connect with the association and find out what are some of the upcoming um, opportunities that they are uh, connecting students and alumni and alumni and alumni. Um, so the association has really done quite a bit over the last 10 years in particular to um, really reach out for this engagement. Okay, and with that, um, so we ran a little bit over, but I'm very happy to have been able to answer so many uh, student questions today. We hope that you got a lot um, from this presentation um, and either learned a lot or learned about some resources uh, to help you along. Um, so uh, my, my colleagues and I will stay on um, for the next few minutes as everyone heads out. Um, but thank you again for attending today and I'm very excited to hopefully see uh, all if not a uh, few if not all of you um, in some one-on-one -on -one sessions soon so thanks everyone have a great evening Bye. Linda, are you still there?